Hi, good afternoon. This video is a continuation of the video that I posted last week, the video entitled A Brief Introduction to God. And in this video, I would like to discuss, if I could, the attributes of God. I realized while I was preparing to, to make this video that as I was going through the Bible, I was looking and I was finding dozens of what could be called the attributes of God. I listed 21 before I said, you know, there's no way that any list I would make could, could even do justice. So I want to start out by saying that I probably will not discuss everything that we could discuss about God. In fact, any one attribute of God that I may list, I may talk about, some of my viewers may find themselves thinking of three or four more that I didn't touch upon. And also, when you think about God, you think about how vast He is, how unlike humans He is, how high He is, how lofty He is. And it seems almost ridiculous to sit here and try to put Him in a box, and that's not my intention. In fact, that is probably everyone's failure when we start talking about God is we always want to put him into our box. Now granted, some of us do have bigger boxes than others, especially when we're talking about the Lord. But putting the Lord into any one of our boxes is absolutely impossible because as God told the uh, prophet, do not limit the Lord God. You cannot limit the Lord God. And I would like to touch on some of the attributes of God because there is no way I could discuss all of them. Now, one of the attributes of God that I would like to talk about, and the reason why I'm bringing it up first, is the Bible repeatedly talks about holiness. Our God is holy. It says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. It says, uh, it starts out the chapter by saying, in the year that King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord high and lifted up. The smoke of his, uh, the train of his robe filled the temple. The temple was filled with smoke. But the thing that I wanted to focus on was how there were angels present, and they cried one to another saying, holy, holy, Holy is the Lord God, who is and was and is to come. Jesus, talking to his disciples, said, Be ye holy, as your Father in heaven is holy. Another place he said, Be perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. The Apostle Peter, in the book I think of 1 Peter, said, As God is holy, so be ye holy, in all your manner of conversation." As God is holy, be ye holy. And before I get too much further in talking about how we are to be holy, and one of the chief complaints about America's church these days is the lack of holiness. First, we have to understand a little bit about what holiness is, because I do understand that someone may come across this video and hear these words and not really know what they mean. What is holy? What is holiness? We seem to have this idea that a holy person is one who just sits around praying all day and has a halo over his head or something. The Hindus have an idea of holy men going around uh, living an aesthetic lifestyle, denying worldly pleasures, denying the reality of death. I understand that holiness may have connotations to some of my viewers that don't exist in the minds of other of my viewers. So I might be using this word and all of us not even be thinking about the same thing. So I would like to define, if I could, holiness. What is holy? Holiness, as it relates to God, is being separate from sin. God is holy. Sin is nothing like God. God is not sinful. God does not lie to make an ends to a mean happen. 
God will not deceive you by telling you one thing and then telling somebody else something else. God does not lie. He is not like man. man it's, the Bible says, let man be a liar, but God is true. Another one of his attributes, that God is abundant in truth. But when we talk about holiness, it means that God will not sin. God does not sin. Sin has nothing to do with God. There is no sin in God at all. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus did not sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. God is sinless. There is none there. And when we talk about holiness, we talk about this attribute of God, that God does not sin. He does not play with sin. He does not flirt with sinfulness. While he wants to lead us one way, he himself does something else. God does not do that. I know that many of us can think of maybe pastors that we knew or Christians that we knew who on Saturday night would go and get drunk and then on Sunday morning be there in church talking about praise the Lord and bless God. And we knew that there was just that area of their life that did not line up with what their actions were we can be assured that God is not like that. God is holy. So we talk about the fact that holiness means there is no sin, there is no wrong. I'm not going to get into what sin is right now because that's a subject for another video and I did briefly mention it in the in brief introduction to God video. God is holy. Another attribute of God that I would like to talk about is love. God is love. It says that in the book of 1 John. It says everyone that is everyone that is born of God, everyone that has experienced God in the new birth loves because love is of God and God himself is love. We talk about God being merciful. He is rich in mercy. That means he cares. That means he helps. That means he reaches out to do something about our sorrows, about our miseries, about our weaknesses, about our failures. It means that he isn't going to destroy us for being weak and sinful and helpless, but he is going to help us. He's going to take our weaknesses upon himself and he's going to bring us to that place where we can experience his strength. God is merciful. God is just. God is the judge of the universe. Just like a judge in a courtroom here in America, we expect him to be impartial. We expect him to be on the side of the law. We expect him to be on the side of right and not wrong. God is just. Abraham said when discussing the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah, if there are 50 righteous people, will you spare Sodom? God said, if there are 50 righteous people, I will spare Sodom. And at one point during their conversation, Abraham said, will not the judge of the universe do rightly? And the answer is yes. God will always do rightly. God is just. We want to talk about God is patient. God is long-suffering. These are attributes of God. These are words we use to help us understand his personality and his nature. We use these words when we talk about him to help us to understand the kind of being we are dealing with. Because again, God is vast, vast, immense. The mind of our God is so far above the mind of man that it would be impossible for us to understand him without his help. And we have this help. We have this help because God sent his son, Jesus Christ. 
And Jesus said to Philip, when Philip said, show us the Father, and it will be sufficient for us. Jesus said, Philip, have I been so long with you that you have not known me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How do you say, show, us the, show me the Father? Jesus said that to Philip. God, the book of Hebrews says, who in sundry times and in diverse manners in times past spoke to us by the fathers, through, uh, spoke to us, spoke to the fathers through the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, Jesus Christ. So when we understand that when we have seen Jesus, we have seen the Father, that should tell us something. That should tell us that the God of the Old Testament, the God who spoke to the fathers through the prophets, is the same God of the New Testament, the God who has revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ in these last days. Because another one of God's attributes is his immutability, his unchangeableness. God does not change. The same God that Moses dealt with on Mount Sinai is the same God you deal with when you pray, Lord, help me get through this day. The same God that spoke with Adam in the Garden of Eden and said, Adam, where are you? is the same God who is calling your name and my name out, saying, my son, my daughter, my child, where are you if you're lost? He's the same God who seeks you as the, same, as the God was who sought Adam. God does not change. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. We understand that God is patient. God is long-suffering. Long-suffering means he puts up with a lot of stuff. He does not want anyone to perish. Why? His attribute of love. His attribute of long-suffering. That's the place where they meet. The place where God's long-suffering meets the place of God's love is where he does not want you or me or anyone to perish. He has given us a way to approach him. He has given us a way to become holy as he is holy. And it's not through works of our own. And it's another one of his attributes. It's called grace. He is abundant in graciousness. He is abundant, abundant in the Bible says where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. And we can look at it like this. When we look at the price that God paid because of his love to purchase us back to himself, when we look at the extremity that he went through on the cross, we also get a taste of the measures he will go through to save us, to bring us back to himself. This is an attribute of God called grace. It's merciful, it's love, it's powerful. Well, someone says to me, but what about God's holiness? Do I have to focus on his holiness at the expense of focusing on his love? And the answer is no. Many people do that. There are many times you'll go to a church and you'll hear a sermon where the, the preacher may be talking so much about the justice of God, the holiness of God, and he'll bring in the reality of hell, and hell is real. He'll talk so much about that that you'll miss that God loves you so much that he does not want you to go there. You see, in God's holiness, he made a way of escape. He made a way of reconciliation. And that way is his son, Jesus Christ, through the blood that he shed on the cross. God's love and mercy does not cancel out his justice and vice versa. We talk about God being holy and hating sin. But he loves the sinner. 
And many people don't hear that when we talk about God's holiness. All they hear is, God hates me. God does not hate you. God's holiness does not mean that he hates you. The fact that he is separate from sin does not mean that he loves you less. does not mean that he loves me less. It means that he wants us to have that attribute also. How do we get the attributes of God into our own lives? We get that through communion with him. It's imparted to us through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us when we accept Jesus Christ. God's holiness is separation from sin. God's love is wanting us to be with him and care about him as he cares for us. Someone asked me, well, if there was no one to love, would God still be love? How did God love anything before there was anyone to love? I briefly touched on that in the last video, but I'll say it again, that within the Trinity, there has always been the love relationship. The Father has always loved the Son. The Son has always loved the Father. The Holy Spirit has always loved the Father and the Son. And the Father and the Son have always loved the Holy Spirit. God did not need us to express His love to. But the fact is, He made us and He offers us His love. The same is true about God's holiness. If I say that God is holy, meaning that God is separate from sin, was God holy before there was sin? The answer is yes. That is who and what God is. Even when there was not sin, He was still holy. Even on that day in the future, when He remakes the heavens and the earth and all things are new dwelling therein, wherein holiness and righteousness will dwell in this new heaven and this new earth, according to the Bible, God will still be holy. He will still be separate from sin. Well, how can you be separate from something that isn't even there? God will always be holy. We talk about God being just. What if no one ever did anything wrong? Where, where's the need to be just? This is just who God is. It's kind of like the idea that a firefighter who goes to the fire station and there's no fire to there's no fire for him to put out. Well, he's still a firefighter. Just because there are no fires currently burning doesn't mean that he stops being a firefighter. Now, that is a weak analogy, just like any other analogy, when we start talking about God. But the point is, God will never stop being God. As I said, attributes are things that define something. And the attributes of God help define who God is. Although, even making a list of his attributes and stringing it all together would never give us the full picture. How do we get a full picture of God? We experience God. How do we experience God? We experience God when God himself comes and lives inside of us through his Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. He said that my Father and I will dwell with you and be in you. He said, I will send you the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth. Truth is an aspect of God. It's an attribute of God. God is abundant in truth. Truth is just that. It is not a lie. Truth is reality. Truth exists. What do I mean by truth exists? Well, let me start by saying that I understand that many people who may see this video have fallen for the idea that there is such a thing as a metaphysical truth that is distinct and separate from, say, scientific truth, or moral truth, or this truth. We, we tend to put types of truth in little boxes 
And somehow we have the idea that God is also in one of those little boxes. Well, what's true for you may not be true for me. Relatively speaking, that's true, but this isn't. God is truth. There is no such thing as a metaphysical truth that is not true in reality. What am I saying? I'm saying that, for example, I'll have to illustrate it like this. In the Hindu religion, not one of the various events recorded in the Bhagavad Gita or any of the other scriptures ever happened in time and space. At no point in time were there ever any giant bird demons attacking villages throughout India that Hare Krishna had to go and save them from. It never happened in time and space. And you can bring this to a Hindu's attention. And if they're honest, they'll say, well, you're right, it didn't happen in time and space, but it's still true. Well, where did it happen? Well, it happened on some other world, or some other time, or some other place, but it didn't happen here. But it still happened. Something can be metaphysically true to this man, and yet not be true. Christianity is not like that. Christianity is based on historical happenings, something that happened in time and space. There were no giant bird demons attacking India. But Jesus Christ did live, teach the things the Bible says he taught. He did die, and he did rise from the dead. This is an event that happened in time and space. This is why the book of Luke talks about when Cyrenius was first governor, when this emperor was in charge, when this person was the uh, Roman official in charge, Luke was careful to say, when this was, this is when this happened. Because we have to understand that truth is truth. It cannot be true and false at the same time. And when we talk about God being truth, God being abundant in truth. It means that we understand that God will not lie. That God cannot lie. That everything that God says about himself is so. Everything that God says happened in his Bible, in the Word of God, happened. Because if it didn't happen and he said that it happened, he would not be truth. And he would not be God. Because God is abundant in truth. God never told us something in a way that we could understand for the sake of telling us something. He didn't just say something and it not be so. God is truth. These are attributes of God. As I mentioned, these attributes help us to understand who this God that we serve is. It helps us to understand him and to know him. But the best way that we can grasp the attributes of God, his holiness, his justice, his righteousness, his peace, the best way that we can grasp God and know him is through a relationship with him, as I mentioned and that brings about the last attribute that I'm going to talk about in this video. And that attribute is grace. I mentioned it before. Now I'm going to define it. Grace is unmerited favor. That means that God loves you just because he wants to. He doesn't have to. At no point in time does God have to do anything anything for us. The Bible says that he sends his rain on the just and the unjust. The wicked farmer and the righteous farmer receive rain for their crops from God because he is gracious, because he is kind, because he is merciful. And he is that way because he wants to be. God offers us help. God offers us forgiveness. God offers us salvation because he is gracious. 
God's unmerited favor. And this is the best way we can experience God.